This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Seahawk by Raphael Sabatini. Section 15. From Part 2. Chapter 7. Marsak ben Assad. It took no less than forty camels to convey the cargo of that Dutch argosy from the Mole to the Kasbah, and the procession, carefully marshalled by Sakhar el Bar, who knew the value of such pageants to impress the mob, was such as never yet had been seen in the narrow streets of Algiers upon the return of any corsair. It was full worthy of the greatest Muslim conqueror that sailed the seas of one who, not content to keep to the tideless Mediterranean, as had hitherto been the rule of his kind, had ventured forth upon the wider ocean. Ahead marched a hundred of his rovers in their short caftans of every conceivable color, their waists swathed in gaudy scarves, some of which supported a very arsenal of assorted cutlery. Many wore body armor of mail, and the gleaming spike of a cask thrust up above their turbans. After them, dejected and in chains, came the five score prisoners taken aboard the Dutchman, urged along by the whips of the corsairs who flanked them. Then came another regiment of corsairs, and after these the long line of stately, sneering camels, shuffling cumbrously along and led by shouting Saharawis. After them followed yet more corsairs, and then, mounted on a white Arab jennet, his head swathed in a turban of cloth of gold, came Sakhar el Bar. In the narrower streets, with their white and yellow washed houses, which presented blank windowless walls broken here and there by no more than a slit to admit light and air. The spectators huddled themselves fearfully into doorways to avoid being crushed to death by the camels, whose burdens bulging on either side entirely filled those narrow ways. But the more open spaces, such as the strand on either side of the Molay, the square before the Saouk and the approaches of Assad's fortress were thronged with a motley roaring crowd. There were stately moors and flowing robes, cheek by jowl with half-naked blacks from the Sous and the Dra'a. Lean, enduring Arabs in their spotless white jellabas, rubbed shoulders with Berbers from the highlands in black camel-hair cloaks. There were Levantine Turks and Jewish refugees from Spain, ostentatiously dressed in European garments, tolerated there because bound to the moor by ties of common suffering and common exile from that land that had once been their own. Under the glaring African sun, this amazing crowd stood assembled to welcome Sakhar el Bar, and welcome him it did with such vocal thunder that an echo of it from the mole reached the very casbah on the hilltop to herald his approach. By the time, however, that he reached the fortress, his procession had dwindled by more than half. At the Sook his forces had divided, and his corsairs, headed by Othmani, had marched his captives away to the bagno, or banyard, as my lord Henry calls it, whilst the camels had continued up the hill. Under the great gateway of the Kasbah, they padded into the vast courtyard to be ranged along two sides of it by their Saharawi drivers, and there brought clumsily to their knees. After them followed but some two score corsairs as a guard of honor to their leader. They took their stand upon either side of the gateway, after profoundly salaaming to Assad el-Din. The Basha sat in the shade of an awning, enthroned upon a divan, attended by his wazir Tsamani, and by Marzak, 
and guarded by a half-dozen janissaries, whose sable garments made an effective background to the green and gold of his jeweled robes. In his white turban glowed an emerald crescent. The Basha's countenance was dark and brooding as he watched the advent of that line of burdened camels. His thoughts were still laboring with the doubt of Sakr el Bar, which Fenzaleh's crafty speech and craftier reticence had planted in them. But at the sight of the corsair leader himself, his countenance cleared suddenly, his eyes sparkled, and he rose to his feet to welcome him, as a father might welcome a son who had been through perils on a service dear to both. Sakr el Bar entered the courtyard on foot, having dismounted at the gate, tall and imposing, with his head high and his forked beard thrusting forward, he stalked with great dignity to the foot of the divan, followed by Ali, and a mahogany-faced fellow, turbaned and red-bearded, in whom it needed more than a glance to recognize the rascally Jasper Lee, now in all the panoply of your complete renegado. Sakar Bar went down upon his knees, and prostrated himself solemnly before his prince. The blessing of Allah and his peace upon thee, my lord, was his greeting. And Assad, stooping to lift that splendid figure in his arms, gave him a welcome that caused the spying Fenzale to clench her teeth behind the fretted lattice that concealed her. The praise to Allah and to our Lord Mahomet, that thou art returned and in health, my son. Already hath my old heart been gladdened by the news of thy victories in the service of the faith. Then followed the display of all those riches wrested from the Dutch, and greatly, though Assad's expectations had been fed already by Othmani, the sight now spread before his eyes by far exceeded all those expectations. In the end all was dismissed to the treasury, and Samani was bidden to go cast up the account of it, and mark the share that fell to the portion of those concerned, for in these ventures all were partners, from the Basha himself, who represented the state, down to the meanest corsair, who had manned the victorious vessels of the faith, and each had his share of the booty, greater or less according to his rank, one twentieth of the total, falling to Sakar el Bar himself. In the courtyard were left none but Assad, Marzak, and the Janissaries, and Sakar el Bar with Ali and Jasper. It was then that Sakar el Bar presented his new officer to the Basha as one upon whom the grace of Allah had descended, a great fighter and a skilled seaman, who had offered up his talents and his life to the service of Islam, who had been accepted by Sakr el Bar, and stood now before Assad to be confirmed in his office. Marsak interposed petulantly to exclaim that Already there were too many erstwhile Nasrani dogs in the ranks of the soldiers of the faith, in that it was unwise to increase their number, and presumptuous in Sakar el Bar to take so much upon himself. Sakar el Bar measured him with an eye in which scorn and surprise were nicely blended. Dust say it is presumptuous to win a convert to the banner of our Lord Mahomet, quoth he. Go read the most perspicacious book, and see what is there enjoined as a duty upon every true believer. And bethink thee, O son of Assad, that when thou dost in thy little wisdom cast scorn upon those whom Allah has blessed, and led from the light wherein they dwelt, into the bright noontide of faith, thou dost cast scorn upon me and upon thine own mother, 
which is but a little matter, and thou dost blaspheme the blessed name of Allah, which is to tread the ways that lead unto the pit. Angry, but defeated and silenced, Marzak fell back a step, and stood biting his lip and glowering upon the corsair, what time Assad nodded his head and smiled approval. Verily art thou full learned in the true belief, Sakr el Bar, he said. Thou art the very father of wisdom, as of valor. And thereupon he gave welcome to Master Lee, whom he hailed to the ranks of the faithful, under the designation of Jasper Reis. That done, the renegade and Ali were both dismissed, as were also the Janissaries, who, quitting their position behind Assad, went to take their stand on guard at the gateway. Then the Basha beat his hands together, and to the slaves who came in answer to his summons he gave orders to set food, and he bade Sakr el Bard to come sit beside him on the divan. Water was brought that they might wash. That done, the slaves placed before them a savory stew of meat and eggs, with olives, limes, and spices. Assad broke bread with a reverently pronounced Bismillah, and dipped his fingers into the earthenware bowl, leading the way for Sakr el Bar and Marzak, and as they ate he invited the corsair himself to recite the tale of his adventure. When he had done so, and again Assad had praised him in high and loving terms, Marsak set him a question. Was it to obtain just these two English slaves that thou didst undertake this perilous voyage to that distant land? Oh, that was part of my design, was the calm reply. I went to rove the seas in the prophet's service, as the result of my voyage gives proof. Thou didst not know that this Dutch argosy would cross thy path, said Marzak, in the very words his mother had prompted him. Did I not? quoth Sakar Abar, and he smiled confidently, so confidently that Hassad scarce needed to hear the words that so cunningly gave the lie to the innuendo. Had I no trust in Allah the All-Wise, the All-Knowing? Well answered by the Koran. Assad approved him heartily, the more heartily since it rebutted insinuations which he desired above all to hear rebutted. But Marzak did not yet own himself defeated. He had been soundly schooled by his guileful Sicilian mother. Yet there is something in all this I do not understand, he murmured, with false gentleness. All things are possible to Allah, said Sakr el Bar, in tones of incredulity, as if he suggested, not without a suspicion of irony, that it was incredible that there should be anything in all the world that could elude the penetration of Marzak. The youth bowed to him in acknowledgment. Tell me, O mighty Sakr el Bar, he begged, how it came to pass that, having reached those distant shores, thou wert content to take thence but two poor slaves, since with thy followers and the favor of the all seen thou might easily have taken fifty times that number and he looked ingenuously into the corsair's swarthy, rugged face, whilst Assad frowned thoughtfully, for the thought was one that had occurred to him already. It became necessary that Sakr el Bard should lie to clear himself. Here no high-sounding phrase of faith would answer, and explanation was unavoidable, and he was conscious that he could not afford one that did not go a little lame. Why, as to that, said he, these prisoners were wrested from the first house upon which we came, and their capture occasioned some alarm. 
Moreover, it was night-time when we landed, and I dared not adventure the lives of my followers by taking them further from the ship and attacking a village which might have risen to cut off our good retreat. The frown remained stamped upon the brow of Assad, as Marzak slyly observed. Yet Othmani, said he, urged thee to fall upon a slumbering village, all unconscious of thy presence, and thou didst refuse. Assad looked up sharply at that, and Sakr el Bar realized with a tightening about the heart something of the undercurrents at work against him, and all the pains that had been taken to glean information that might be used to his undoing. Is it so? demanded Assad, looking from his son to his lieutenant with that lowering look that rendered his face evil and cruel. Sakr el Bard took a high tone. He met Assad's glance with an eye of challenge. And if it were so, my lord, he demanded, I ask thee, is it so? I, but knowing thy wisdom, I disbelieved my ears, said Sakr el Bard. Shall it signify what Othmani may have said? Do I take my orders, or am I to be guided by Othmani? If so, best set Othmani in my place. Give him the command and the responsibility for the lives of the faithful who fight beside him. He ended with an indignant snort. Thou art over quick to anger. Assad reproved him, scowling still. And, by the head of Allah, who will deny my right to it? Am I to conduct such an enterprise as this, from which I am returned laden with spoils, that might well be the fruits of a year's raiding, to be questioned by a beardless stripling as to why I was not guided by Othmani? He heaved himself up, and stood towering there in the intensity of a passion that was entirely simulated. He must bluster here, and crush down suspicion with whirling periods and broad, fierce gesture. To what should Othmani have guided me? he demanded scornfully. Could he have guided me to more than I have this day laid at thy feet? What I have done speaks eloquently with its own voice. What he would have had me do might well have ended in disaster. And had it so ended, would the blame of it have fallen upon Othmani? Nay, by Allah, but upon me. And upon me rests then the credit, and let none dare question it without better cause. Now these were daring words to address to the tyrant Assad, and still more daring was the tone, the light hard eyes of flash, and the sweeping gestures of contempt with which they were delivered. But of his ascendancy over the Basha, there was no doubt, and here now was proof of it. Assad almost cowered before his fury. The scowl faded from his face, to be replaced by an expression of dismay. Nay, nay, Sakr al -Bar, this tone, he cried. Sakr al -Bar, having slammed the door of conciliation in the face of the Basha, now opened it again. He became instantly submissive. For give it, he said. Blame the devotion of thy servant to thee, and to the faith he serves, with little wreck to life. In this very expedition was I wounded nigh unto death. The livid scar of it is a dumb witness to my zeal. And where are thy scars, Marzak? <laughs> Marzak quailed before the sudden blaze of that question, and Sakr el -Bar laughed softly in contempt. Sit, Assad bade him. 
I have been less than just. Thou art the very font and spring of justice, O my lord, as this thine admission approves, protested the corsair. He sat down again, folding his legs under him. I will confess to you that, being come so near to England in that cruise of mine, I determined to land and seize one who some years ago did injure me, and between whom and me there was a score to settle. I exceeded my intentions in that I carried off two prisoners instead of one. These prisoners, he ran on, judging that the moment of reaction in Assad's mind was entirely favorable to the preferment of the request he had to make, are not in the bagnio with the others. They are still confined aboard the Karak I seized. And why is this? quoth Assad, but without suspicion now. Because, my lord, I have a boon to ask in some reward for the service I have rendered. Ask it, my son. Give me leave to keep these captives for myself. Assad considered him, frowning again slightly. Despite himself, despite his affection for Sakhar Bar, and his desire to soothe him now, that rankling poisoning of Fenzele's infusing was at work again in his mind. My leave thou hast, said he, but not the laws, and the law runs that no corsair shall subtract so much as the value of an asper from his booty, until the division has been made, and his own share allotted him, was the grave answer. The law, quoth Sakhar el -Bar, but thou art the law, exalted lord. Not so, my son, the law is above the Basha, who must himself conform to it, that he be just and worthy of his high office. And the law I have recited thee applies even should the corsair raider be the Basha himself. These slaves of thine must forthwith be sent to the Bagnio to join the others that to-morrow may be sold in the souk. See it done, Sakhar el -Bar. The corsair would have renewed his pleadings, but that his eye caught the eager white face of Marzak and the gleaming expectant eyes looking so hopefully for his ruin. He checked and bowed his head with an assumption of indifference. Name thou their price, then, and forthwith will I pay it into thy treasury. But Assad shook his head. It is not for me to name their price, but for the buyers, he replied. I might set the price too high, and that were unjust to thee, or too low, and that were unjust to others who would acquire them. Deliver them over to the Bagnio. It shall be done, said Sakhar el -Bag, daring to insist no further, and dissembling his chagrin. Very soon thereafter he departed upon that errand, giving orders, however, that Rosamond and Lionel should be kept apart from the other prisoners until the hour of the sale on the morrow, when perforce they must take their place with the rest. Marsak lingered with his father after Oliver had taken his leave, and presently they were joined there in the court by Fenzele, this woman who had brought, said many, the Frankish ways of Shaitan into Algiers. End of section 15 Read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California for LibriVox Summer of 2006